Welcome to this new episode of Ask Stago, the podcast dedicated to provide expert answers to your expert questions in hemostasis. I am Audrey Carlo, and I'm really happy to be the podcast co-host today with my colleague Cecile Orkin. In this episode, we will be answering some questions we receive quite frequently. How to handle the lot conversion process when receiving a new lot of reagents in the clinical lab? And ideally, of course, how to make it as smooth as possible. And to answer our question and cover this topic, we are happy to welcome Rachel Lama. Rachel, you are an experiment technical support specialist within our US team. And prior to be part of Stago, you were also an instructor for medical technicians. Lot conversion is Zeus, a question you are dealing with for quite some time, I suppose. Hello, Rachel. Hello, Cecile and Audrey. Thank you for inviting me. Hello, Rachel, and welcome to Ask Stago. As you know, our habit here is to start with the basics. So what is lot conversion, actually? Well, what we face in the clinical laboratory, whatever the specialty, is that from time to time, due to expiration dates or stock renewal, your reagent and or your internal quality control lots are changing. However, as part of risk management procedures in your laboratory, you need to ensure continuity and consistency of results delivered. Yes, imagine a patient follow-up where you face a shift in results due to a change in reagent that will be puzzling, if not a high risk for the patient care. Exactly, Cecile. Therefore, prior to putting the new lots of reagent in production, as we say in the lab, you must confirm you can accept the new lot delivered. For this purpose, the lab needs to perform experiments for lot conversion or lot confirmation acceptability, as the College of American Pathologists says. So, to answer your question, Audrey, lot conversion is the experimental procedure applied in the laboratory when a new reagent and or QC lot is received to ensure it can be placed in service without affecting in any way the patient results. And this procedure is not optional as it is a requirement for lab accreditation. Very clear, Rachel. And so, how do you suggest to perform this acceptability experiment? Well, the CAP Common Checklist provides some insight. And in 2014, the Clinical Laboratory Standard Institute also published a guideline, CLSI EP26-8, called User Evaluation of Between Reagent Lot Variation, that details a possible procedure and acceptance criteria. But as the CAP also say, at minimum, the protocol applied locally to check for new reagents lot and or new shipments of the same lot must follow the manufacturer's instruction. This is why application specialists and technical super specialists like you, Rachel, are a great assistant for the laboratory. Yes, but of course the data manager accreditation tools also ease the process, making it very simple to follow and report. Indeed, because we should not forget this question of reporting or re keeping records of results and acceptance criteria to define. But coming back to my initial question, Rachel, how do you suggest or compare two reagent lots? Well, it depends first on the type of assay. For qualitative assays, the ones with a yes-no response, basically, the minimum cross-checking between the two reagent lots includes testing a positive and a negative sample. If your assay can also report results as weakly positive, then you also have to include such a sample in your comparison. Of course, it means that these sample are qualified as such. So you qualify them with previous batch already in service and test them for the new batch to confirm you keep consistent classification for them. Yes, they can be qualified on the previous reagent lot. But samples can also be received through proficiency testing experiments, external quality assessment programs, or just commercial samples intended for this purpose. And so I suppose that there are the more samples you can include to confirm this absence of change in classification, the better, is it right? On a theoretical perspective, of course. But this is not always very practical, and you still have to contain the impact of the procedure for the laboratory as it is done while they're still live running their routine activity. And so, Rachel, can you detail the procedure for the other type of essay, the quantitative one, as most of the ones in the coagulation laboratory are? Sure. Well, here you do not rely on previous qualification anymore. And you have to test samples with both lots, the pre-approved and the new lot in parallel. So you can either select samples from your routine activity according to the residual volume and their analyte concentration, or purchase sets of samples, usually frozen sets, if it's stated in their package inserts that these are intended for the specific test method that you are using. 
meaning that reagent and instrument type. If those purchased sets of samples are more general purpose, their commutability with patient samples must be ensured. And from what you said, Rachel, about the analyte concentration, I guess that we must ensure that samples cover as much as possible the measuring range? Exactly, Audrey. And the laboratory will also like to make sure that some samples are at the clinical decision limit levels, if there are some. CLSI EP26 A provides some tables to calculate the number of samples to be tested depending on the rejection limit or critical difference criteria. And just one tip I remember from my time in the field if the experiment is done for a new shipment of reagent, but from the same batch using the quality controls used in the laboratory for this method, is acceptable as it remains the exact same lots and production. And this explains also why some labs are asking to their manufacturer to have some reserved lots, as we call them. Sometimes the lab does not have the space to keep many boxes in their fridges or cold rooms, but they know in advance their usual activity for the year. So they ask the manufacturer to keep part of their stock on hold at the manufacturer's sign in the warehouse. Yes, that's true. And Cecile, you're right to remind us that the procedure should be done for new lots of material, but also a new shipment to accept it and confirm nothing wrong happened during transport. And so, now we know what that conversion is, why we do it, how we do it. But we're still missing one question, how to confirm the new lot is acceptable. Can you have a word on this, Rachel? Sure. Even though there's no real gold standard criteria to confirm acceptability, depending on the assay, the acceptance criteria can be different. Sometimes the criteria are hooked to the actual assay analytical performance, for example, its precision, but they can also be related to the known biological variation. And yes, when you combine inter and within individual variabilities, like in the reference range, change value, the RCV formula. Yes, Audrey. Besides the acceptance criteria can be on the correlation coefficient for quantitative assays, slope and intercept of the linear regression equation, absolute or relative bias as per Bland and Altman representation, the mean of differences, and so on and so on. Yeah, we can go. We can go. About. And by the way, you can maybe ask here your provider to provide you validated Excel spreadsheets where all those calculations are made with a full trustability. And if you are even more lucky, maybe your data manager are actually uh, equipped to do those calculations. And it's probably also meant to be uh, storing the records of these procedures too. As we said earlier, I'm sure this is the kind of documentation auditors would like to see during accreditation audits. Oh, definitely. Evidence of compliance are needed with both records of these experiments and the results, but also the procedure in place for the confirmation of acceptability and acceptance criteria. Ladies, time is flying. We will not have time to discuss lot conversion for quality controls and the refining of quality control ranges today, but for sure we will do it in the next episode, don't worry. Rachel, what would be the main message that you want our listener to keep in mind after this podcast? I really think that planning is key, knowing when you have to perform the lot conversion, which materials you need, being sure that the procedure and the criteria are predefined, this eases the process tremendously and in the end ensures continuity of service in the lab and therefore a delivery of care. Thanks a lot, Rachel, for this conclusion. And thank you both, actually, ladies, for shedding some light on this subject today. It is now time to close this episode. Thank you all for listening. And as usual, all literature sources are listed in the podcast description. And please feel free to send us any question that you may have at our email address, askastago.com. We'll be glad to answer it in the next episode. See you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Stago. Diagnostics is in our blood.